Oh my god, hi. This is Devin from Disney Adult, a podcast brought to you by the Trident Network. On Disney Adult, we bring together Chicago comedians to watch and discuss Disney movies from the perspective of adults. In these movies, there are things we love, things we hate, things that maybe haven't aged so well, and things that are timeless. Uh, The Trident Network's wonderful podcasts, including Disney Adult, can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. Subscribe today. Gia! What, you scared? No. Yeah. Hey, being scared, that's half the fun. Your heart pounding so hard, all you want to do is quit, and then doing it anyway. They're going to think I'm a major dork. You don't surf for your friends. You do it for yourself, for the way it makes you feel inside. It's like floating on clouds. Come on. Wow, I was not that insightful at 13. (laughs) I was like, do you guys want to go to Laser Quest next weekend? (laughs) Hey, Val. Hey, Al. Welcome to D Commentaries. Oh, thank you. Welcome to you and welcome to all of our listeners. Today, we're talking about Rip Girls. Wait, Val, should we start over and say, Aloha, Val? (laughs) Wait, do it. Do it, Val. Do it. (sighs) Okay. Wait, okay, but include all of this. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. (laughs) Aloha, Val. Aloha, Al. Welcome to the commentary. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Welcome to you and welcome to all of our listeners. Today, we're talking about Rip Girls. Yay. Yay. (laughs) Surf's up. (laughs) Surf's up. Um, Quick disclaimer, Val, before we get started once again. Mm -hmm. Um, If you haven't heard within the last um, 45 seconds of the podcast. I am a little screechy again today. We were hoping after two full weeks, my voice would have gotten a little bit better. Um, but the curse of Harry Styles and the curse of the White Sox have got, <laughs> got my throat in a bind. And I went to uh, the White Sox playoff game on Sunday where they won. And then tonight they lost. So they're out of the playoffs, but that's okay. A few years ago, um, this is a complete side. A few years ago, I told my cousin they would win the World Series in 2022. So I have high hopes for next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll keep an eye out. There's also a White Sox connection in this movie. I'll point out in a minute. (gasps) Very exciting. Yeah. Well, I mean, they do mention Chicago a bunch. so They do, but that's actually not what it is. But I will tell (gasps) you what it is when we get there. All right. Uh, But first, we actually have a couple shout outs to give. (gasps) Yay. We love shout outs because you know what? We love our listeners. That's right. We do. So two people became Trident Network Patreon patrons and um, requested a shout out from us (gasps) because they love us and we obviously love them and we're very grateful to them for for supporting trident and us by extension um so al do you want to give the first one sure we'd like to shout out lindsay bellix woo lindsay woo lindsay also thanks for sharing us on your instagram yeah lindsay gave us a shout out of her own yeah what a sweet surprise Mm -hmm. i did this val i said (gasps) (laughs) when i saw it i'm gonna make a gif out of the face you just made (laughs) Um, and our second shout out is for someone very special to me, my mother-in-law, Linda Rossi. Yeah! Thanks for birthing Val's husband. <laughs> oh, wow. You just made it weird. <laughs> Why? Without Linda, Michael would not be here in which you would not be married to Michael. That is true. And thus, by extension, I probably would not be making this podcast because my life would be very different than it is today. That's true. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. This got meta. <laughs> um, you know what's I'm, not meta, Val? Rip girls. That's true. <laughs> um, but real quick before we get to that, I did just want to say thank you to Linda for bringing to life my husband and for <laughs> supporting my entrepreneurial endeavors and creative endeavors. I love yeah, you. We love supportive parents. Yes. Um, 
Let's talk about Rip Girls. Yay. Uh, Rip Girls came out on April 22nd, 2000. So we're still in the monthlies. Uh, It was directed by Joyce Chopra, who was the, I looked it up, first woman director of a DCOM ever. Wow. Yep. Wow. Um, 16 movies later. 16. It took 16. I'm not super surprised. We'll get more into no. my disdain for, <laughs> for, for the old, DCOMs. For the old <laughs> mouse house um, in a little bit. Um, but she has had a long career of directing mostly TV movies and television shows. Some notable ones are Everwood and many of the Law & Order franchises. Uh, Rip Girls was written by Jean or Jeannie. I'm not sure uh, which pronunciation is correct. Uh, Rosenberg, uh, who also wrote The Black Stallion, White Fang, and The Journey of Natty Gan. Um, all kind of young adult movies. So definitely her wheelhouse. Um, the cast is not as big this week, so we'll rock through it. And also most of them haven't been in much of anything. Um, Camila Bell played Sydney Miller. Um, she hasn't really been in that much. Like she's no, been- but she's um one of Joe Jonas's exes. Oh. She's the one that Taylor Swift wrote a song about. <laughs> That's really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Uh, Dwyer Brown plays Sydney's dad, Ben, and this is our socks connection. So Dwyer Brown oh, yep. mm-hmm. has been in a lot of stuff, but one of the things he is most famous for is that he's in the movie Field of Dreams and he plays yes. one of the, he plays, uh, Kevin Costner's dad, who was one of the disgraced white socks, or as they call them, the black socks, who basically threw a, a series of games to make money. Mm -hmm. like bet against themselves and then make money off of it so he even though he i believe is younger than kevin costner he plays his dad in the movie ghost daddy he he (laughs) so he was a white sock um okay stacy has played gia and this was her only credit so i'm gonna guess based on the fact that pretty much nobody else has been in anything either that they actually found people who knew how to surf rather than people who were experienced actors. And then Gia was selected out of them to be the main person because she was the best actor out of Mm -hmm. the people who they found who could surf, um, who were Hawaiian. I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah, I think that that, that's my guess. Um, I would like to say, too, that last week, this is, um, you can put this anywhere. Last week I did say, I know there's blonde people in it. There were no blonde people. Yeah, you're thinking of Blue Um, Crush, I was thinking of Soul Surfer. Oh, Soul Surfer, okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, decidedly no blonde people in this movie. Yeah, which is a good thing because we like when Native uh, Hawaiian people are cast in roles and not just white people who moved to Hawaii to yeah. to be in the movie. Right. Or at minimum, like, I don't know if every single person was native Hawaiian, but I do know that the, that the majority of people who live in Hawaii are of Asian descent if they are not of like Polynesian descent or like Hawaiian mm-hmm. descent. So it was much more realistic than like, for example, in Johnny Tsunami. Where, where all of his three friends his, are white. Right. All of his pals were a bunch of blonde boys. So um, this made a lot more sense. And they even tried to make... Brian Stark, who plays Kona, like they tried to pick someone who was a little bit more, I guess, ethnically ambiguous to play because like they needed someone who was an actual actor and they made an excuse why he didn't couldn't surf during the movie, obviously. And so he is like the one kind of like we had to cast someone who is not authentically. um, Yeah. Well, other than Camilla Bell. Yeah, I think she's Brazilian. Maybe. I, I don't know. I looked up her Instagram and she has a, a, a the Brazil flag in her bio. So oh, I think she's probably. like half Brazilian. OK, cool. You know, it's interesting. I was I, I, I forgot that I wanted to bring this up, but I guess it, it has just rebooted Doogie Howser. Mm-hmm. But they've Doogie Tapahala. Yes. So they've set it in Hawaii and there's a lot of hubbub about the fact that the person that they cast as Doogie or whatever they're calling her is not Hawaiian. Oh. And so they kind of have, I mean, unsurprisingly, I guess, back in 2000, but like they still have an issue with casting people who are not ethnically what they're 
representing. Um, so I will give this movie credit that other than the two like lead actors, they casted people who are seemingly at least from Hawaii. Yeah. Um, and, sure. and can surf. So they also didn't have the problem of like when Johnny Tsunami is out surfing, it's clearly a grown man who looks nothing right. like him surfing, right? Like they had close-ups of these kids surfing, which was really cool. I thought it like helped a lot with the mm -hmm. sort of even feel. Camilla Bell had some a few shots, which I think were like in a studio with a green screen behind her, but it was still her on a surfboard. You know? Yeah. I think there was at least one shot where like maybe someone was like swimming under her board, kind of holding it steady, but she was definitely like in the surf mm -hmm, on the board sure. standing up. So yeah, it was good. Um, okay. Getting back to it. So I already said Brian Stark was Kona. Um, Jeannie, again, Jeannie or Jean, I'm not sure. It's spelled in both cases J-E-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E, and I know people who go by both of those pronunciations with that spelling. Um, it, would it be Jean? Uh, it could be in this instance, uh, but I've only known people with that spelling to either be Jean or Jeannie. Jean. Okay. Um, but anyway, I don't know. Whatever it is, Jeannie, apologies if it's mispronounced. Maury. Um, played Malia, who is Gia's mom and uh, Sydney's mom's best friend. Um, Lauren Sinclair played Elizabeth Miller, who is Sydney's stepmom. And Keone, I did look up how to pronounce that. Keone Young um, played Bo, the like, I don't know if he was the mayor or the city council person or their lawyer. I'm not exactly sure who he was, um, but he was sort of the the person who was advocating for Sydney and her family with like the realtors and everything who were trying to buy her her house that she was inheriting. Um, mm -hmm. And he has had the the biggest career out of. I was going to say I recognized movie. him. Yeah, he's been he's a character actor. He's had a huge long career, and not just in on camera but also as a voice actor so like as a character actor he's been in stuff like alias and deadwood among many many other things um like nc he's been in like multiple ncis episodes um but as a voice actor he's been in two different star wars properties including the new one that just came out star wars visions um or been a voice actor in it and then um avatar the last airbender it looked like he had a pretty prominent role voice cool. role on that oh. so he's definitely been busy. swimming in money yeah he's doing well <laughs> um so yeah pretty uh pretty cool uh dude and yeah that's the main cast there were some other people around but those were like the main primary people nice um we've got another short synopsis this week uh a 13 year old learns to surf while visiting hawaii for the first time to see a plantation she inherited <laughs> Um, I mean, it's like half right. Yeah, it's not inaccurate. It's just sort of like burying the lead. But yeah, that I guess, you know, you could argue it's a synopsis. It shouldn't give anything or give everything yeah. away. So, yeah, not the worst we've heard for sure. Mm -hmm. um, OK, Al, what were your first impressions? Thanks, Val. First impressions were fine. I didn't hate the movie. Um, I thought that. All of the montages and all of the dead space to me was kind of like, why is this in here? Mm. Um, while I did appreciate some of it because it, you really got to see a lot of Hawaii and you got a lot to got to see a lot of culture and things like that. I was like, all right, let's let's go. It's been 45 seconds <laughs> every eight minutes. And so it was just like kind of like a lot of fluff for me. Um, the acting Fair. wasn't great. I thought I it was thought, leaps and bounds better than Alley Cat's Strike. Oh, so for I sure. was like, yeah. this is great. <laughs> I think it was just like some delivery of things. I'm like, mm, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but overall, I'm going to give it a six out of 10. Okay. Um, I would watch it again uh, if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think I really gave it a six out of 10 because I really did like the plot. Like, I really did yeah. think that it was a really well, fl like, fleshed out, fleshed out? Yeah. Um, plot. Um, there were just a few things that um, I was like, eh, okay. <laughs> Where, like, I wanted to just, like, fast forward 30 seconds and then they still would be shopping at the grocery store. You know, <laughs> I don't know. It was just, like, a lot of dead space for me. That's fair. Yeah. What were your first impressions? 
Um, I really liked this, actually. I had never seen it before, and at least not that I remember, And um, which I will talk about in a minute um, why I think that is. But I really, I thought it was obviously, like I said, much better acting than the last movie that we saw. Alley Cat Strike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, too, really liked the story. I thought that there was a good amount of character development. I thought that they didn't shy away from deep like concepts and difficult yeah. concepts, mm -hmm. um, which I appreciated. And I thought that Sydney, for the most part, acted it well. Like she she was able to carry the like emotional weight that she had to for this movie. She's kind of playing this. I actually identify. I think part of why I liked this movie is because I kind of identified with her in, in a few different ways, like <clears throat> not so much the being treated like glass, but just sort of like being kind of precocious and adult-like as a teenager. Oh, yeah. She was, like, very... She had to be very mature for this decision that she was making. Yeah, and I think that it made sense, given the fact that she had to have kind of this interior, very, like, academic kind of life, you know, like, playing chess with her dad and all that kind of stuff. Like, right. I just, like they did a good job without telling, which is a problem that some of these movies have. They showed who she was and what her way of seeing the world was. And I thought the metaphor of the camera was a really nice way of also illustrating that where she was right. always kind of on the outside looking in rather than like on participating. The outside always looking in. in. Will I ever, ever be more, more than, than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tap tapping on the <laughs> glass, waving through, through a window. window. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that lines up so much. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I and I also identified with her to some degree with her sort of being a part of a culture, but not feeling a part of it at all because of decisions that her parents have made rather than yeah. like her own choice. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, it's more like my mom kind of choosing not to really participate heavily in her own family. And so like I don't speak their language. I've met them like a handful of times ever and those kinds of things. So like, I just feel separated from that side of my family and, and culturally in a very similar way to kind of what she was experiencing. So I definitely related to that. Um, the only thing in the movie that really like kind of just felt shoehorned was Kona. I was just like, why is this guy here? Do we have to have a romantic relationship? Yeah. She had more romantic chemistry with Gia anyway. And I think <laughs> that if they made this movie today, they would just let that be the romantic relationship. Yeah. Um, it's only because this was 2000 that they felt like they had to create a hetero like situation because like there was no reason for him to be there. Mm -hmm. at all <laughs> as, yeah, as far as I, think, I can tell I think too it took them a while to introduce him mm -hmm. and then there were times where if you're gonna have him put him in there more mm -hmm. it, they kind of like half-assed his his like part you know yeah I agree like I either agree. have him in there and like have him be in there or don't have him in there at all right right he's supposed to be Gia's best friend but they like never interact until the end of the movie right um, so I just, yeah, I felt like it was kind of whatever, mm -hmm. but otherwise I liked it. Um, oh. Al, did you have any quotes or moments that stood out to you? Yeah. Um, uh, when she's opening up the cabinet and looking at family pictures and dad goes, these are old. <laughs> I thought that was really funny and, uh, <laughs> like fucking duh. <laughs> Oh, my God. You're treating me like a baby, Dad. I'm 13. I just always think that's so funny. I know. Um, Is that in Halloween Town, too? Basically the same mm -hmm. line? Yeah. Yeah. Powers. What powers? <laughs> that's my favorite line from Halloween Town. We need to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Um, sometimes adults get lost in their own problems. Mm. I just think it's funny because that was the stepmom talking about dad. And, uh, at this point, dad's incapable of talking about himself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just thought it was funny that that was her justification. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I did like the part where, um, with Kona, um, when she goes up to Gia and she's like, is he as together as he seems? I know. Which I thought was so funny and so mature for a 13 year old. Cause I would be like, 
<laughs> is he actually really good at soccer? You know, like I would know. Is he act? Is he as together as it seems? Like Camilla Bell was so mature in this role. I, I thought she was really well cast. Yeah, she's great. Uh, and then um, when they're uh, when they're talking about her, so this I, this is a spoiler, but not really because it ha- you find out very early on, but that uh, uh, Sydney's mom passed away and she has a stepmom. Um, you literally find out in the first narration of the movie. Yeah. So, um, but she goes, how am I supposed to fight a ghost? Oof. <laughs> when talking about their relationship. Oof. And I was like, Ooh, girl, that was like, deep. That, that was whole... so, that was a great line. Mm-hmm. That was a great line. That whole conversation um, was awesome. Yeah. And then there was more, um, ADR that I thought was hilarious of give me that you dork yeah you think you're funny give me that and it was just like I that's all I pay attention to now is the background (laughs) when something else is going on (laughs) oh it's so Um, yeah so those are a few of my favorite point of ports a few of my favorite (laughs) ports Val what were your favorite quotes and moments um, so right before she says that, uh, is he, is he really that together? She says to Kona, you're a poet. I didn't expect it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was just like, what? Uh. Um, she says there's not a lot of surf in Lake Michigan, which I would call into question on certain stormy days. Yeah. There was video footage on the news like a week ago of people like on runs on the Almost Lake Bridge Trail. Almost getting into the undertow. <laughs> yeah. On the sidewalk. So, so I think on certain days you might be able to catch a wave. Um, how about the week after never? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was so funny. Very 2000 expression. Mm-hmm. They did have some good surf terms in there, which I liked. Yes, for sure. Like the waves are rude or something. And I was like, oh, what? yeah, <laughs> I know. I liked the whole like exchange where they're like praying to the goddess Hiyaka. Mm hmm to for better waves and they're like pioneer surfer chick our forebear our guide like all that so it was cute it was cute i think that is it yes nice. those are my quotes okay. um but then in terms of moments i definitely want to doubly shout out that whole confrontation between stepmom and dad that was like really like that that was like almost from a movie that this wasn't right like that was like a very like adult conversation and i guess this movie kind of was that but like it was even more adult than the rest of the conversations um in this movie and it was was, very adult for a decom yeah i was very impressed i really liked liz like the stepmom i really liked her character a lot they definitely in the beginning make you feel like she's going to be some kind of villain yeah when in turn she actually is kind of the hero in a way yeah she totally is she's Mm -hmm. like the only person who can have healthy conversations about things and just be upfront, like literally of anyone in this movie and how is she supposed to fight a ghost you can't you can't can't. fight a ghost you can't fight a ghost Mm -mm. mm-mm mm-mm Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Happy Halloween! It's, I was just gonna say because it's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> See, we uh, did do a Halloween episode. We did do a Halloween episode. Rip girls, <laughs> R.I.P. Girls. <gasps> oh God! Oh my no. God! Wait, all of the people in this movie are ghosts. No, stop! <laughs> <laughs> and the only person wait, who's alive is mom. The whales came to see them because they're in the spirit world. Because they're <gasps> ghosts. Oh. <gasps> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Oh no. That's like this changes everything. <laughs> Spooky. All right. Do you have anything else you want to cover before we head on down to Spoiler City? Um, I don't think so. I feel like everything we can kind of chat about in Spoiler City and bingo. Oh wait, I did want to talk about one thing. Oh, sorry, no, we already decided. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the fact that I think that there is, I think conspiracy is a strong word, but I think that there is an inherent bias in the way that Disney programmed their decoms that is becoming more and more apparent as we go along. Because the movies, especially recently, we've seen a number of movies that had like all black or POC casts. And now we've seen the first movie directed by a woman that is like from a girl's perspective. And 
Um, the point is, the vast majority of these movies are either white, predominantly white, and or led by men or boys um, mm -hmm. that have gotten the most attention or like the most promotion, with the exception of Xenon and Halloween Town. And I have never like I've heard of this movie vaguely, but like I really didn't know what this movie was about at all. Yeah, I d had no concept and I really enjoyed this movie. And I think I would have enjoyed it when I was 13, because like I said, I identify very much with a lot of who she is and what she's going through. Yeah, I am literally the exact same age as Camilla Bell. I'm literally the perfect age to see to have seen this movie. How did I not see this movie when I've seen all of the movies of surrounding the it? Yeah. The only thing that that and same thing with Up, Up and Away. I'm pretty sure I have maybe saw it one time ever before we watched it for this show. Why? Why? I I could be wrong, but it feels very much like these movies were not programmed as heavily as some of the other ones. And yeah. what and I, I drew this uh, comparison before we started recording. But like I talk a lot about how like in women's sports, there's always this argument that people make where it's like, well, we're not going to give women the same platform as men or the same equipment or the same marketing or whatever, because they don't bring in as much money. They're not as exciting for people. But the reason why nobody knows about them or is excited about them or respects them is because you aren't investing in them. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, it's like these movies that weren't promoted as much, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. They weren't promoted as much, so nobody watched them, so nobody was asking for them. So they so they just kept showing the same movies over and over again. That is my hypothesis. I obviously was not in the room making decisions about programming, uh, at but that is my guess. And I just wanted to put it out there because it annoyed me um, and it is increasingly bothering me the more we're watching these movies. We'll see if I include that, but I just wanted to... No, I think have it's, it no, I, I think it's important. I think it's important to bring up because that's what we're doing as adults looking back on our childhood. You know, we're we're taking these things that were really important to us and dissecting them in a way that wasn't in 2000. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important. I you know, I want to say Val as we do the next 16 and the next 32 and the next multiple of 16 by 3. Um <laughs> I want to tell you that it's going to get better. I want to tell you that, yeah, there are going to be more women leads and yeah, it's going to be more directed by women. I don't think that's true. I, don't I think either. it takes them a really long time to get to that point. Even past once we're adults, you know, I think it's still mm -hmm. something that they're working on. Yeah. I definitely think we're still working on it and I mean, you know, who are we right now? But maybe someday we'll have more listenership. So I want to call it out because the only way things change is when people who have any amount of influence whatsoever say something about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, promote your movies equitably, Disney. And I'm not going to bleep that one because I want them to hear it. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, my. <laughs> Val just <laughs> spit fire out of her <laughs> mouth. Are we going to Spoiler City, Val? Yeah, we're going to Spoiler City. Let's We're surfing right on over. Our tops are off. <laughs> Real tops and bikini tops are off. Okay, this people? Is, this is a topless beach. Topless beach in Hawaii. We're live, laugh, loving here. <laughs> Welcome to Spoiler City, where we spoil the movie. I feel like last week I didn't do that, and it made me sad that I didn't um, do like a cute little intro, but I think I was like really tired last time. <laughs> yeah, didn't I do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was like way out of it, and uh, um, it was you, it was, Val. It do, was not, do not, <laughs> don't you dare do that. It was, <laughs> it was a fine placeholder. It wasn't you. You did great. Um, <laughs> welcome to Spoiler City, where, where we will spoil the movie for you. Um, so if you don't want to watch it, um, you can just listen to this part. And if you do want to watch it and listen to this part, you get to hear our fun comments about the stupid shit that they do. Um, okay, great. Uh, lights up on an airplane. We have, uh, Cindy, uh, and her parents who are flying back to Hawaii. We find out that it's her dad and her stepmom are flying back to Hawaii. We don't really know why yet. Um, but she kind of does like a narration 
um, which we hate narrations <laughs> here at D commentaries. And then it never came back. <laughs> the narration. Which honestly, thank you. <laughs> like, yeah, thank you. But like it never came back. So she was born in Hawaii. They moved away and they're going back. Um, she's a photographer. She really likes photography. She's 13 years old. They get to Hawaii and they're exploring this really old house. And there's not so much context in the beginning. And this random guy comes in and is really excited to see Sydney. And his name is Bo. And we find out that Sydney is the last remaining heir of the sister's granddaughter. Um, so they're in that house. So this house is very old. Um, it's very preserved. But everyone has died. So it's basically like grandma died and the last living granddaughter is Sydney. And they have to stay for two full weeks in Hawaii in order to inherit the house. Um, and the house has also been in that family for five generations. It is also a working plantation. The, the caveat here is that it's a working plantation, but they, um, there are two options, keep it and have it be in the family, live in the house, live on the plantation, keep the beach, or, um, you can sell it to like a hotel chain that will build a hotel and all of the things that we don't want to do to a beautiful Hawaii that are still currently happening. So it's like, that's kind of the big contention here. So we didn't really mention it pre spoiler city, but that's kind of what's going on is they have two options. They can keep the plantation and preserve the school and the barn and the, the beach, or they can sell it all the way and make honestly, probably millions of dollars. So at this point, we're getting the vibe that dad sucks um, because he is like super gung ho on selling it. But also there's kind of something about him that he's not really saying. There's just something he's keeping very reserved. He's very protective of Sydney. He's very Marlin from Finding Nemo. Very, that's a great way to put it, Val. Um, very like just super like you can't go do anything. Like you have to be home. Like I need eyes on you. Just very, very protective. Um, so then Sydney's kind of exploring on her own and she sees this black cat kind of around the house. And then she ends up following it to the, the barn where it leads her to, or this, like, it's like a house or a barn or something. And what she it's runs barn, into yeah. a, a surfboard. It says Nanny Loa. She has some kind of emotional connection to it. And while she's carrying the surfboard out, she wants to take it back to the house that they're staying. Um, she runs into a girl who falls off her bike and that's Gia. Um, so they become very fast friends. It's literally like, hi, who are you? Hi, who are you? And then they end up hanging out looking at her computer. So that just happened all very fast. <laughs> and then Sydney shows Gia some of her photography on her Apple computer product placement. <laughs> and, um, she is like super in photography. She asked dad if she can go to the beach and he says, no, he's just really like, no, you can't go to the beach. You can't go surfing. You can't do anything. And she kind of lies to him and says, I'm not going to go surfing dad. I'm not going to get in the water. I just want to go take pictures. Um, which is not true. Um, she does end up like kind of wanting to go surf, but not really knowing how. Um, so she meets Gia and all of her friends and she kind of lies to them that she does know how to surf when in reality she doesn't. So then everyone kind of finds out that she had been like lying about surfing um, because of the way she talked about it. We also meet Kona at this point, the love interest, and he kind of calls her out for saying weird things that she doesn't know. She doesn't know the terms, um, but then they actually like teach her how. So she like gets a little less and she doesn't go in the water yet, but she just like starts to, um, you know, be, she starts to become one with the group. Um, then we pull away and we go to a real estate office where these two people are trying to get the family to sell them the property, which I should mention that Sydney, this is Sydney's decision since she's the last like living heir. This is her decision, which I think is a very heavy task for a 13 year old. And I don't know that I agree with that, but also it's a movie. Um, <laughs> She meets up with her friends. She finally surfs. We actually see her out on the water. She stands up on the board. She's having a great time. Um, she talks about the boy, Kona, and they're like, you know, sitting on their boards. Um, but then she gets up to surf for the next time uh, and she catches a bad wave. And Kona comes and saves the day, dives in. And the crazy thing is he's wearing a Dear Evan Hansen cast, okay? Because <laughs> um, that boy dove in with a broken arm and saved her. 
She then like wakes up in a strange location. She doesn't really know where she is. And there's this strange woman um, that we end up finding out is Gia's mom, who is very kind, very nice. And Gia's mom, uh, it's Malia. She says that uh, Sydney looks exactly like her mom. And so Sydney's kind of like, oh, you knew my mom. And she was like, oh, it's uh, what was the name again, Val? Nanny Loa. Um, So then uh, Malia says, Nanny Loa. Oh, that was her surfboard. And um, it turns out that Sydney had wrecked the surfboard um, and she was really upset because then she then finds out that it was her mom's surfboard and she admits to dad she goes home that night because she had a uh, like a cut on her head yeah yeah a cut on her head um and admits to dad that she did go surfing and he was pissed he yells at malia um gia's mom for like telling sydney because she doesn't know any of like the things about her mom. And then um, stepmom sticks up for Sydney and kind of sticks up for herself and is like, Hey, you're being kind of a dick. And then this is where we find out that dad is mad because mom died in a surfing accident. And Sydney never knew that. So she didn't know why he was being so protective, why he was being the Marlin from finding Nemo. It's because mom had passed away in a surfing accident. Um, so we kind of like find out about that. And then mom, you know, sticks up for Sin- the stepmom sticks up for Sydney, which we said earlier, stepmom kind of like in the beginning, Sydney was like, I- we're not really close, but like throughout this, they get pretty close. And stepmom is actually really, really great. Mm-hmm. Um, we, and then, um, so we kind of like cut away from that. We get back to the fun. Um, the, the girls are meditating on the beach because um, this is one of Val's favorite parts and they're, you know, doing this chant to the surfing gods. Um, and they get attacked by squirt guns and it was just really super cute. Um, and then Kona comes and, and shows Sydney that he drew her like surfing, which, Definitely he did not do. Um, and it was definitely some, you know, PA intern who drew that. But he's an art boy, a pensive but he's art a, he's boy. he's a poet. <laughs> he's a poet and an artist. And so then he's like, oh, do you want to go see the, the actual plantation home on like the land? And she goes, yeah. And he goes, do you know how to ride? And then they end up on horses. Which and then we have another funny. horse date. Another horse date. Val loves those horse dates. <laughs> And then they like go explore the house and they get, they like go into a room and Sydney completely freezes. And she's like, I think this was her room. And so she ends up thinking that she was in her mom's room. And she was like, I, you know, I definitely, um, feel like I've been here before when I was two years old that night. Um, she gets like a knock on her window or hears something in the bushes and it's Gia and her friends who they're going to this big Hawaiian celebration. Um, and it, the, one of my funniest lines happened of, Gia says, Malia sent us. And I was like, that's, I had to like relook it up to see like, that's her mom. I would never go to you, Val, and be like, oh, Terry sent me. (laughs) Like, what? (laughs) No. Um, That threw me off. So they're like doing like a really cool Hawaiian ritual where they get to watch the whales on the beach, which was very beautiful. Um, Kona translates a story of the Hawaiian grandma telling a story very much like the opening of Moana, um, which I thought was really cool of that similarity there. And then we don't almost kiss. We real kiss straight up, right to the real straight up real kiss. And then uh, Malia tells Sydney the story of mom's accident. So she kind of goes into the details of like exactly what happened of she was a great surfer. This never would have happened, you know, all of these things. And Sydney gets really upset. She goes back home and dad is waiting in the window, waiting for her to come home. And he's like, um, and she's like, I left you a note. And he goes, I don't care. And she goes, yeah, but like, you never told me about mom. And he is like shocked. And like, she found out. And I thought that was really cool of Sydney. Sydney is very mature in this movie. She's really mm-hmm. awesome. Um, and then I wrote dad finally therapizes to set mom <laughs> where he finally admits that he's been a dick this entire time. And then he also does the same to Sydney kind of apologizes and says like to both of them, like her death really affected me. And instead of talking about it, I pushed it to the back of my mind and really just tried not to think about it. But now that he's back in Hawaii, he really realizes 
it is more prevalent in his life than he thought. Mm -hmm. And oh, right before it was so sad, right before when she got mad at dad, she ripped mom's picture in half, uh, which was so heartbreaking. Um, But then she ended up uh, like taking a picture of it and Photoshopping it back together, which I said, Photoshop existed in 2000. Uh, It did. Which is crazy and so cool. So then she it's like photoshops the picture of her mom onto a picture of her headshot, which I think is really funny. <laughs> she had a headshot when she was 13. Um, it wasn't like a real headshot. It was like someone took a picture of her, but like it looks like a headshot. And then um, her friends are mad at Sydney and we don't really know why she goes like, hey guys, it's like the next day she's in a good mood because she and dad made up. But then the, the papers came out and said that they're tearing down the beach because Someone had said that her family was actually going to sell the beach and the plantation home and all of this, this historical Hawaiian, you know, culture and land. And so all of her friends are really mad. And Kona was also mad too, but he made her a personalized surfboard, but they, um, I think that Kona and Gia were basically gave her kind of the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Whereas the others didn't. Right. I wrote, find out they planned it. Oh, so when Sydney goes to see Gia after this whole thing happens, Gia is upset on the beach because she we f- find out after a second that she feels like she failed because Sydney realizes that the whole thing, Gia running into her and befriending her was all orchestrated by Malia to try to convince Sydney not to sell the land. Yes, 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 yes. So her falling in front of her on the bike was like completely planned by Jen. Right. And we do Mm -hmm. see at the very beginning of the movie, someone is looking through binoculars at the house. Um, And I think you're supposed to think that it's like the real estate people or like some weird, you know, like thing with that. But it's it's actually Gia figuring out when she can run into. Wow. I did not notice that. Good catch, Val. Um, so they find out that, you know, they plan to stop the build and they run to Malia. Malia has a locket of Cindy and her mom and they run to find Gia because she's really upset, but they can't find her and she finds herself on the beach. It's really rocky. It's like, like Michigan last week. And Gia is just like in the open water, kind of drowning. And Sydney surfs out to save her and it's super rocky, but Sydney is like, I don't care. Like Gia's my friend and she saves Gia and tells And tells her that they didn't sell the plantation. So basically dad, like she went back to dad and said like, no, I'm not doing this. Like, this is not what I want. And dad has been therapized and he (laughs) listens to his 13 year old daughter. So now he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt (laughs) and they decided to stay and like keep the plantation a running plantation and uh, everything, you know, is uh, happy go lucky. Yeah, she literally, the ending of the movie is her with a thumbs up and a freeze frame smiling. Yeah. (laughs) No narration, though. No narration, thank goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, The more I think about it, um, the more I think the reason this movie is so emotionally intelligent is because it's written and directed by a woman. The reason that that scene happens between Liz and Ben where she confronts him is because this movie is written and directed by a woman. The like the reason that Sydney intuits what's going on is because this movie was written and directed by a movie. Literally everything about this and I would not even be surprised if the entire relationship bet- between her and Kona was like shoehorned in later because it's the only part of this movie that doesn't feel you know a part of that sort of like maturity and whatever yeah um every single female character in this movie has a ton of depth and has motivations this movie definitely passes the Bechdel test it 100 passes the Bechdel test um and also i like and i think this is also because a woman <laughs> wrote and directed this movie the dad never actually like he literally says like i would love to make this amount of money like i will never see this amount of money ever and even at the end Like, and, but he says like, despite that it is your choice and I will support you. Right. So he's like being a good dad, but he's also being honest that like, Mm -hmm. it does matter to him. And even at the end, he literally is like, yeah, like he basically says, I don't know if I agree with the decision, but Liz tells me it was the right one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like he literally is like, I'm shallow and care too much about money, but my wife is the voice of reason whom and, I love. Right. And like made me realize, or at least told me that I need to get on board mm-hmm. <laughs> with this situation. Um, 
which I thought was like very interesting because I think in most instances it's more like like in Alley Cat Strike, for example, we have a boy who confronts his dad at the end about putting too much expectation on him. And mm -hmm. he's it's just this sudden like emotional intelligence out of nowhere with no context. And then the dad just is fixed. He just like gets right. it instantly. Like that's not realistic. This process that all of them went through to sort of like deal with all of these emotions and realizations throughout the movie felt realistic. And maybe that's why it felt a little long or stilted to you because they were taking the time to sort of like really process this stuff. Like the fact that she tears her mom's pictures because she is mad at her mom for going surfing when she had a toddler, like mm -hmm. for taking that risk, despite the fact that she had a baby who she should have been prioritizing. Right. Yeah. But like at the same time, she realized she comes to realize that my mom was a human being with interests and her own like needs and desires. And she needed to do what was important to her. Right. Yeah. And like, I just, I think that like this, this might be the most emotionally intelligent movie that we've seen. I think it is the most emotionally intelligent movie that we've seen. Oh, so for far. sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, th I mean, I don't know. I think it's good. I just think that some, po some points it was just like a little, huh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, liked all of the like strong female characters in it. And, um, I also, I mean, we'll get into this when we get to the villain and box in our bingo square, but <laughs> I really did too like that. It, it, it's sad to me that this didn't take off enough because it is so important to the people of Hawaii to preserve their land. Mm -hmm. And that is still an issue today. Yeah. And like all of Hawaii is being turned into resort and it sucks because like, I would love to go to Hawaii. I would love to vacation there, but I know that it is so bad for their environment mm -hmm. and it makes me sad. And this was an opportunity for Disney to really show people, Hey, we can preserve this really cool thing and we can preserve the culture and we can preserve the, the nature and the history that is Hawaii and it didn't take off enough for anyone who saw this to give a fuck. Well, and they probably just didn't promote it as much also. And that makes me so sad. I know. And you know what Disney did instead? They built a resort on Hawaii. Um, it, <laughs> yep. They did. They did do that. Doing exactly what this movie was against. I know. I want to get ahead of the, of something because there is a possibility that I'm going to go on my honeymoon to Hawaii and Michael desperately wants to stay at Alani. I, so I just want to I want to say that because if people see on social media that I've been that you're in Hawaii, in Hawaii they're going to say, remember Disney your rip, resort. Your rip girls up somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want no, to address and you know, it. I'm sure Val, there is someday that I will go there, too. And I would like my dream is to like go to Bora Bora or go to the Maldives or go to Fiji, you know, and it's all the yeah. same thing. It's all all the same thing. It's, it's tourism and it's, and yeah. you know, yeah, tourism does help their money, but it's, I think it's just making sure that we're also protecting the culture and protecting 100% Hawaii as, as well. You know? Yeah. 100%. I mean, we absolutely should acknowledge, like we obviously can't go back in time and like fix all the wrongs, right. but we can honor and respect and at least do our best not to do any more damage. The right. weird the conflicting thing in Hawaii is that because of the way their economy has become, they need tourism as much as they don't. Right. Now um, it's too late. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like a hard thing. It's like we've been conflicted about this because like we've wanted to go to Hawaii for our honeymoon for two years. We we haven't been able right. to take our honeymoon because of the pandemic. And we like almost started booking stuff. And then there was like all this social media because like the second that everyone could travel again, literally everyone went to Hawaii at the same time and they were like inundated and it was this awful mess. Right. And so we were like, oh God, maybe we shouldn't go, but like, maybe it'll be different by the time we go. Maybe they will need, you know, they, they need people to go and travel right. there because they do not have like an economy other than tourism. Right. Well, and I think Val too, it's, it's, I think obviously, you know, you will be respectful of that and you're not going to go and destroy habitats and you're not going to go just litter and things like that. You'll sure. be very conscious. Um, also 
you and Michael are being very conscious of the fact that you haven't gone in the last year. You know, you're being very conscious of we're going to wait until COVID is no longer rampant there because we don't want to add to the problems they're already having because their ICUs are full. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, it sucks to, to say like, we're going to postpone our honeymoon even more, but like, we're going to wait until we can go when it is good for their economy and it is good for us to be there. And so I think that's, you know, the, the, the most respectful thing that we can do. Yeah. Well, I'll do my best. Yeah. I'll try not to mess anything up there. Yeah. Don't if fucking we litter when you're there. <laughs> If anyone has any suggestions for other places that are less fraught that would be nice to go to in January or February, let me know that are that we can for sure travel to in a pandemic. That's sort of the those are the qualifiers and are is not Florida because we've spent enough time in Florida. Um, all right. Shall we bingo? Welcome to Rip Girls Bingo. Whoosh, whoosh. Those are the waves. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. whoosh. Um, all right. You you know you know what to do. You know what to do with that big fat butt. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. All right, you know you know what to do with the bingo card. Um, Val, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I can start. You do it, girl. Okay. One hit wonder song. There were songs in this movie, uh, but I don't think that they were one hit wonder songs. Breaking the fourth wall or looking into the camera. No. No. Holiday themed. <laughs> Is it Halloween themed? <laughs> Spooky. Put a little. Okay. So Val, when you put this on Instagram, <laughs> just put a little pumpkin there. Okay. You know, it doesn't count. Just put a little pumpkin there. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'll put a little pumpkin there. Clunky metaphor. Oh, yeah. The camera, baby. Oh, yeah. She's waving through a window slash window. mirror. And, and they took it so far as to say or as to do that she had like the big fancy camera for the beginning part. Right. But then at the end, she had a disposable cam waterproof camera. Right. That, where she could like still be in the water, in the waves, but still taking pictures. So, well, I that's because, that, well, and Gia said at one point, she's like, well, have you ever tried in the water? And she's like, no. Yeah. So, so I had was, so I many underwater good. cameras as a kid whenever we'd go to oh, visit my grandma at the beach. Oh, my God. Oh, I my thought God. they were so cool. Every summer at camp. Come on now. Even oh, literally, yeah. even last year at alum or two years ago at alumni camp, I had a disposable water. Oh, my camp. gosh. You're so cute, Val. <laughs> Anyway, um, parents who just don't get it. Yep. Very much. Very much. I don't even want to put him in cool dad or hot dad. Like the, he just doesn't belong on the chart. A uh, cool non-parent adult. I think Malia. Yeah, Malia and Bo. Oh yeah, Bo too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, someone too famous for a TV movie. I don't think so. Not at this time. No. Competition to resolve a central problem. No. It was uh, the other kind of resolution, saving someone's life. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a fun climax of the movie. That mm -hmm. actually happens twice in this movie. It does. A montage sequence. Yep. A lot. Literally like 40 million. <laughs> There's like 40 million in this movie. DCOMs are making Ellie hate montages. I really, I'm really, really starting to hate them. <laughs> At least this one. This one just had too many. Yeah. Well, I think like using montages and, and also narration as like cheek a cop codes. out yeah, yeah they're just like oh well we need it to be oh, an hour and 20 minutes and our plot isn't thick enough so let's just add in some time and which is funny because i don't think it, this movie needed that it didn't i think they could have explained everything without the narration and i think that they didn't need all the montages i think one montage of her learning how to surf is yeah. sufficient yeah cliche villains capitalism, capitalism. <laughs> We both literally said that at the same time. <laughs> that was not planned. I just want everyone to know that was not planned. But if you watch this movie, the villain is capitalism. It is. It is 100% capitalism. That just broke, Val. <laughs> I just thought it was cool that we both said it at the same time. I didn't know you were a poet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yep. Yeah, cliche as hell. Yeah. 
Uh, clothes or items that you owned? Well, we've already established that both of us had waterproof disposable cameras. Oh, that's true. Um, Rotten Tomatoes, 40 to 60. Uh, oh, God. It's probably lower than it should be. Um, I'm going to go right in the middle, 50. 61. <gasps> Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. 61. Better than I expected in a good way. Yeah. I think that lines up with my views as well. Yeah, for sure. Like mm -hmm. that's what I would have guessed if I wasn't cynical about human beings. <laughs> uh, happily ever after. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, almost kissing. Well, no, because there was kissing. There was but, a real kiss. But do we count? Have we been counting that? We have number? counted it before. Okay. All right. Then it counts mm -hmm. now. They've surpassed almost. Because they do straight. almost kiss before they real kiss. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Because you have you have to be really close. Yeah. Someone who became famous. Um, I would say Camilla Bell became half famous. Okay. By because like, by proxy. she did date Joe Jonas, so she was she was valid enough that I knew who she was, and was like, oh, Camilla Bell's in this movie. Okay. Fair. Thanks, Val. <laughs> Betraying of one's real friends or values? Uh, no. No, the only argument that if we wanted to say yes was like, she really for the first time went against her dad, which was like going against her like learned values. But even then, that's kind of just like a not really. Yeah, I think that I think that um, if she had been the one, like if she had done what Gia did, then it would have been. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, if she deceived, because like honestly, she doesn't even really try and lie to her dad. Like, you know what I mean? She almost immediately is just like, yeah, I went surfing. Like, I mean, I know she got hurt, but like, she yeah. doesn't even try to hide it. She just like right. outright tells him. Um, and I think if anything, she like sticks to her own values, mm -hmm. and like the fact that she like, um, even after being really angry and feeling betrayed by her friends, she still does the right thing. She doesn't act out of spite. I think in every stage of this movie, she is very much in line with her values. Nice. Great. Your childhood crush. Nope. Nope. Obviously bad special effects or stunts. The whales. The whale. Yeah. Um, okay. We've got our decom stars, Eric Von Detten, Kirsten Storms, Ryan Merriman, Kimberly J. Brown, or any Lawrence brother. Nope. Nope. No, sorry, Bob. Nope. Musical number. No, no. Uh, magic. Nope. The only magic would be like the cat leading her to. But yeah, like, yeah, I, I guess know. there's sort of like spirituality in this movie. Like mm -hmm. she sort of senses her mom and things like that, stuff like that. So I guess I mean, we can count it if you want. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Is spirituality magic? <sighs> <laughs> I don't have time to get into that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't I think either. that that one part of the movie was magical to me. Okay. Let's count it. Cool. Someone says the title of the movie. No. No. Not even close. No. And the title of the movie is not a great title. Like it has no, it's nothing terrible. to do with anything. Yeah. What would you rename it, Val? Um, I would either maybe name it Nanny Loa mm -hmm. or, you know, something a little bit more descriptive or. Yeah. Scooby Dude. I mean, kind of like yeah. she saves Gia and like she makes the choice not to sign the contract, but there's not really like a mystery. There's not really solve. something to save. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. there is, but like, that's not like, uh, pulling the monster's mask off, you know? No. If anything, even though it is a 13 year old doing it, this is very adult stuff. Yeah. So it's not very Scooby Doo esque. Right. Yeah. yeah. The heroes create the problem. No. Nope. Capitalism created the problem. Capitalism. Yep. And, and a rogue wave. And rogue waves. Uh, lead is a fish out of water. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> All right, Val, looking at our bingo card, we got no bingo this uh -oh. week. We need a childhood crush or musical number this week or oh, round okay. tomatoes, but that's okay. Okay. Well, but it's still a very pretty board. Yes. Oh, Val. 
You know what time it is? Is it game time? It's game time, baby. <gasps> and this week we're back to an actual game. This week I've uh I've created the game of Surf and Turf. <laughs> This is a game of surf and turf. (laughs) Um, Thanks for playing, Val. Um, I have a list of words. And the word is either a surfing term. Okay. Or a type of fish. Okay. Because I was like, oh, this is great, turf. And that's not what turf means. Nope. Um, But that's still a good name, though. And it's still something you can eat on land. That's true. So, um, Val, I'm gonna I'm gonna say the word, and if you think it is surf, you will say surf, mm-hmm. and if you think it is um, a f- t- a fish, then you would say turf. Got it. Okay. All right. There's mm-hmm. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have a total of seven that you can get here. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Number one, surf or turf? Barney. Surf. That is correct. <laughs> Barney is a surfer that is not cool, untalented, or a rookie. Whoa. That seems right. Okay. All right. Here we go. Next word. Surfer turf. Chunder. That means puke in British slang. Uh, Surf. You are correct. (laughs) All right. It is totally unsurfable waves. Oh, well, that kind of makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Surfer turf. Jake. Turf. Incorrect. Oh. Surf. A surfer who inadvertently is in the way of more experienced surfers. Oh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Surfer turf. Lump sucker. (laughs) Turf? You are correct. (laughs) I don't. It's a fish. Mush. Turf? Surf. Ah, oh. soft, non-surfable waves without any energy. Okay. Psychedelica. Turf. Turf looks like a frogfish. Whoa. Last one, Val. Okay. Blenny. Surf or turf? Oh. Surf? Turf. Oh. I changed Type my answer at the last second. Oh. Ah, that's okay. Val, congratulations. You did get the majority. You got four out of seven. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, that's the game of surf and turf. Surf and turf. Surf and turf. Surf and turf. <laughs> wow. I think that means it's time to go home. <laughs> You're already home. Wow. What a sweet, ep- sweet episode. I feel like we really covered um, a lot here in Rip Girls. Yeah. This is a great one. I I enjoyed this app. I enjoyed this movie. And I always enjoy you. (laughs) Wow. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Val, I love you so much. I'm so grateful for you. We've got some good movies coming up, guys. It's going to be it's going to be a fun way. You know, we're almost to the end of the year. We've got some fun things coming up. Our next movie is going to be Miracle in Lane 2. We'll have a surprise Mm -hmm. guest. And we will also be featured on um, an upcoming Trident Network podcast, um, which you'll see more information on our Instagram. But we're really excited to collab with one of our Trident um, family members. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. There we are. Like and subscribe. Yeah, as always, like and subscribe. Leave us reviews. All right. Thanks for joining us, and we'll we'll see you in two weeks. See you there. Bye, Val. Bye, Al. This podcast was produced by me. And me. And it was edited by me. The music was composed by Michael McNally. You can find us online at thetridentnetwork.com slash decommentaries hyphen pod. And you can find us on Instagram and TikTok at decommentaries. Decommentaries is a part of the Trident Network. To learn more about our videos, live shows, and other podcasts, please visit thetridentnetwork.com. Disney Channel Original Movies. Damn it, Ellie.